Welcome to the Aeronautical Information Optimization Summit, delivering data that matters. I'm Abby Smith, and I'm the Director of Technical Training. That's my day job anyway. My other real big job is to be the FAA's Executive Champion of NOTA Modernization, or Notices to Airmen. Today, uh, we're going to, uh, the, to our topic is data standardization and data integrity of aeronautical information. There's three things that we're really gonna focus on today around aeronautical information, or as we call it, AI. One is to talk about the changes we've already made. Two, to talk about the changes that are on the way. And three, and most importantly, to answer your questions. We are so honored so many of you could join us today We've got people from the aerospace and drone industries. We have people that are aviation consultants. We have app developers. We've got federal, state, and local government representation. We have educational uh, institutions and even members from our international civil aviation agencies. It's really great that you're all taking time out of your day to join us for this very important way forward for us to improve the aeronautical information that we provide for you. And at this time, I'd like to welcome Jill Olson. Jill will be our MC today. She's the group manager of the Aeronautical Information Group in Aeronautical Information Services. Jill, over to you. Why don't you tell uh, the folks in the audience a little bit about yourself? Hi, Abby. Thank you. I am just so happy to be here. Hi, everyone. I've been with the FAA for 13 years. And as my title suggests, my day, job, my day job involves data, data, and more data. My group is heavily involved with at least every aspect of the aeronautical information and NOTA modernization effort. And I'm so happy to be here. Now that you know a little bit about me, I'd like to welcome all of you who joined us via, joined us in our Zoom webinar. And welcome also to those, to those joining us via Instagram, Instagram and on live social media. I would like to highlight a few techn technology notes for today's session. First of all, we're recording this session. And for those of you in Zoom, please use the Q&A feature to share your comments and questions. And for those on social media, please use the link provided in the platform comments. We're going to be monitoring those questions and comments and we'll respond to as many as possible. Finally, even though we put in place every contingency plan, it is possible that technical difficulties may occur. If they do, please bear with us and we'll try to reduce any impact to your experience. Abby, please join me back and let's talk about how the series topics were determined. Hey, Jill. Hey, thank you for coming back. So last November, the agency hosted the NOTAM Data Optimization Summit to share progress on modernization efforts and hear from the aviation community, right? Oh, yes. In fact, we heard loud and clear during the summit a number of themes. Predominantly, there is the need for a real single data source. Then also specific data formats were, were requested and also flexibility to manipulate the data. And all of that drove the topics for this summer series, didn't it? Absolutely. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing data standardization and data integrity, like I said just a couple of minutes ago, of aeronautical information. And we'll be addressing themes of standard data formats and authoritative data sources today. Well, great. That's right up my alley, as I mentioned before. Indeed. That's all what my day job is. So what's happening in, in next week's session on August 13th? Well, we're going to be spe talking specifically about transforming aeronautical information, specifically NOTAM or notices to airmen, if people aren't familiar with the term NOTAM. That data and then the Aeronautical Common Service, again, another acronym we like to call the ACS. Then on August 20, we're going to be looking at another, a very specific type of NOTAM called the Temporary Flight Restriction and the Temporary Flight Restriction Data, or TFRs, as we call them, and touch on, again, issues of standardization, consistent geospatial data, and the flexibility to manipulate that data, and the authoritative source of that data. Well, that sounds great. And I know on August 27th, we have a very special event planned to focus on the new entrants, 
the drone community with a session on unmanned aircraft, aircraft systems or UAS. I hope we have a big crowd for that one. And at last check, I think we have about 853 already registered. Well, Abby, wow. tell us, isn't that amazing? It's awesome. So tell us what was, what's going to be so special about the final session of this series? Well, I'm really excited about our summit, our final summit, the RAF, on September 3rd. We are going to be using that time to really look at what's our way forward from here. And I'm really excited because we'll have not only the chief data officer from the FAA, but also the chief data officer from the Department of Transportation. And they're gonna be talking about application programming interfaces or APIs, which was a huge uh, feedback piece that we got from the November summit. I really hope a lot of people tune in because I think this is really gonna be the culmination of six great weeks of work. Awesome. All of these series sound so, so interesting. I'm going to, I'm going to want to be a part of every single one of them. So thank you. Let's have Brian Murphy join us for this next segment. So Brian is an FAA manager on the data systems team within Aeronautical Information Services. Hey, Brian, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself, let people get to know you. Hey, Brian, you're going to need to unmute your mic. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> it's a part of the technical flow of this. Yeah. <laughs> Great to see you both. Um, like Jill said, I'm a uh, manager on the data systems team here in the FAA. And my focus at, at, as part of that job is around aeronautical information management, aeronautical information products and services, data governance, and really delivering uh, this information efficiently to our stakeholders. Um, one thing that I'll note too is I helped lead the FAA's external data access initiative back in 2016, yeah. which was fundamental in providing better access to our data by utilizing open standards and publicly available application programming interfaces, or as Abby said, APIs. Well, awesome, Brian. So glad to have you here. So Abby, Brian, what do you say? Let's get this party started. Let's do it. So Abby, what would you like to know first before we dive deep into aeronautical information? Maybe well, help set the stage for those not so familiar? Yeah, I think um, one of the first things that we wanna talk about um, is root data. Uh, but you know, if, if, you're not, if you're not in aerospace, you might be thinking, what is root data? And what does it have to do with aviation? So Brian, could you give a little context, please? Yeah, I'd be happy to. And you're right. If you're not familiar, um, root data can mean several different things. What we're talking about for this session, at least, is uh, two types of data with route data. And that's preferred routes and coded departure routes. Preferred routes or PREF routes are instrument flight rules uh, or IFR routings developed by the air, tra air route traffic control centers to provide a smooth flow of air traffic on busy city pair routes. Now, coded departure routes, or CDRs, in the United States and Canada at least, are pre-planned alternative routes between a specific city pair that can be quickly activated when traffic constraints exist. Hey, Brian, can you just give some examples of those, if you don't mind? Oh, sure. So when you think of PREF routes, Think of, um, think of a PREF route as flying from Boston to JFK Airport in New York. Um, and coded departure routes are most frequently activated when there's a thunderstorm, turbulence, excessive demand. And like right now, as the East Coast and, and South are experiencing hurricane season or winter storm season in the North and all across the U.S. during thunderstorm season. Now, now, I remember as uh, part of the Aeronautical Information Services Reform Coalition, there was a lot driving the change to update route data. Could you please tell us why, Brian, this was important? Yeah, this was important. Um, so preferred route data was accessible from multiple locations. Uh, and this posed some issues, obviously. So. Route data, you could get that from the route management tool online. You could get it from the National Airspace System Resource or NASA subscriber files, or you could get it from the chart supplement. 
as you're seeing an example here from the chart supplement, as you see in the slide. So for example, when a user uses this information from the chart supplement and does their, um, uh, does their flight plan, they send that flight plan and it, they may get an updated flight plan back from because the information published in that chart supplement may be different than that in ERAM or the FAA's air traffic system and route automation modernization system. And Brian, I remember we, would, we had this conversation about that. We knew it was causing unnecessary rework for the user, draining time and resources, which we never want to do. And you were determined to create a system that was much more user friendly. Yeah, that's exactly right, Jill. We knew it needed to be less confusing and more consistent, no matter where our stakeholders retrieve this information. Brian, given all that, can you tell us a little about the efforts that you went through to, to fix this and make it standard? Yeah, sure. So obviously it was a necessary effort and certainly not trivial. As you can see by these numbers, we had a, almost, almost 6,000 changes to make in, the, in this database. So that's really to give you a, a real sense of the enormity of this work. And can you explain a little bit, Brian, why all this effort to standardize was so important? Sure, happy to. So when a user requests preferred route data, one of the first things they have to do is they have to provide information about what they need in the area description field. Entering data in a standardized way in this field helps the person using that data know what they're looking at. So after we got started standardizing the area description field, we were able to address other fields like the highest altitude or aircraft limitations as, as two other examples. So as we went through and cleaned up all this data and put it in more standard terms, we had another positive outcome. The integrity of the existing data was improved. And that's, that's highlighted in where I mentioned we had almost 6,000 changes in the data. Well, that is great. And what did this end result? What did this bring? Yeah, sure. So now that the data has been cleaned up, the information will be more useful for our users. And stakeholders won't need to put in as much manual effort to use and transform the data. So end users aren't the only ones that use this data. For our stakeholders who build uh, cool tools or apps based on aeronautical data, consistent data makes their tools work better. Without standardized, without standardized data, developers have to do a lot of manual labor. Before we standardized, uh, updates to the chart supplement as, as one little example were all manual based on changes made in a PDF file that we call the National Flight Data digest. Of course, you can imagine doing these manual changes that can re result in unintended errors. Now, with these standardizations, it updates with the push of a button. Publishing consistent data across multiple sources results in a safer national airspace system. No longer will users need to guess where the, where the data is accurate, no matter where they're pooling it. And this is key across all sources. Ultimately, users spend less time with the data. They have enough to do with pre-plan, with their pre-flight planning, like checking their NOTAMs or the flight alternatives, et cetera. Great. So now that we've got some context about aeronautical information, what do you guys say we uh, turn our attention to hearing from our participants? Great idea, Jill. I mean, the whole point of the summits is, is to answer questions and, and help get the word out and, and help people get feedback. Great. So just remember, for those of you participating via Zoom, use the Q&A feature to share your questions and comments with us. And for those on social media, use the link provided. So Brian, looks like we got a question. Um, the question is, where can I get root data? Is this standardized and available now? Yes, it is. Actually, you can get it through the FAA's Aeronautical Information Services website, um, and where you can easily download the subscriber files. Um, so real quick, that, that URL is a nice, simple one, faa.gov slash go slash AIS. 
for aeronautical information services. So look on the left side of the page for the digital products, and we'll also post the, the URL in the chat. Great, thank you, Brian. So, Brian, I know that there's a whole bunch of different types of aeronautical information. Could you maybe give us an idea of what some of the common types are? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So as we're going through this session, we'll highlight all, all of these. And these are just some of the, the common types of aeronautical information that we, that we like to talk about. Um, and so as we go through this, we have the letters to airmen, or LTAs. We have letters of agreement, or LOAs. Temporary flight restrictions, TFRs. And two, of, two that are really close to my heart are aeronautical charts and obstacle data. So I'll go through and I'll explain all of these. And as we're going through it, please utilize the Q&A function and we'll, we'll try and get to all of your questions. So the first of these that I'd like to hit on are the letters to airmen. Now, the letters to airmen, they're not NOTAMs, but our stakeholders access them through the FAA's NOTAM search site. These, like NOTAMs, would be, would be reviewed by pilots as part of a pre-flight pre activity. So Brian, we've got another question for you. The question is, will the PREF route data be cleaned up automatically from now on? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And yes, that whole process is now, because we have a single authoritative database for this information, it will be cleaned up and will be consistent across all those platforms. And that's, that's really key for all of our information and something we're striving to do. So it doesn't look like we have any more questions at the moment. You wanna go ahead and talk about letters of agreement? Sure, I'll move on to our next data point. And that's the letters of agreement or LOAs. As you know, we, we love our acronyms in the FAA. So LOAs, we know that they exist between FAA facilities, but are not publicly accessible. Yet flight ac operators are expected to know the information and file accordingly. These are often signed agreements and procedures between two facilities. So knowing this, the FAA is working to provide these outputs in digital formats. And that, that's important for our stakeholders. That's feedback that we've heard. Definitely. It looks like we just got a question on LTA. Sorry to bring you back to that. Uh, but the question is, where can I get LTA data? Yeah, sure. I, I did kind of gloss over that pretty quickly. So LTA data, li like I mentioned from the, the NOTAM search site, you can, um, all of our users can get the LTAs from NOTAM search at NOTAMs dot AIM dot FAA dot gov slash NOTAM search. And we'll put that link in into the chat. Awesome. Um, so now just a quick question on LOAs that just popped in. Where can I get that information? Yeah, LOA uh, data is not currently available. Uh, we, we've been hearing this from our stakeholders that it's a big ask. So it's something that we're keeping an eye on it and working towards it. But I'll take that back with me and I'll take that back to my leadership and we'll see if we can provide better access to this information. I think that's, that's important with this dialogue that we're doing is, is really bringing this information back and helping our stakeholders drive where we go. Definitely, and, and just a question from our drone pilots, do they need to have L LTAs or LOAs? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm glad to hear from our drone community because they're, they're an important part of, of, of aviation now. So there's, there's no requirement for drone pilots to be appraised of the information contained in LTAs or LOAs. Uh, certainly, there are many instances where more information can help a pilot make an informed decision concerning their flight. Um, ultimately, though, it's the responsibility of all pilots to operate safely and avoid other aircraft. Great. 
Uh, another question that just came in, um, what AirRink standard are we using? And can you explain what AirRink is? Sure. Yeah, well, well AirRink is actually a company, but when, when we hear AirRink, it's AirRink 424 is a uh, industry standard format. Um, and the FAA is currently utilizing version 18 with some 19 in it as well. Um, when, I when I mentioned our Aeronautical Information Services site, we do have in the digital products there, a, a link to our Coded Instrument Flight Procedures product or CIFP. And that's our Airing 424 product. And, and posted along with that is all the information that a user would need to understand what version we're using. So Brian, uh, can you also, does ERAM, can you explain, does ERAM have the Prefruit data? And can you explain a little bit more what ERAM is? Sure, so ERAM uh, is the Enroute Automation and Modernization Program. It's the air traffic system that helps us have the safest and most efficient NASA in, in the world, the National Airspace System. Um, and ERAM does have preferred data. They have preferred data and they have the coded departure route data. And they get that through us, the Aeronautical Information Services site, working closely with air traffic control. Hey, Brian, I just got a question in. Is the data format that FAA uses for PREF routes compatible with flight planning services? Uh, that's a good question, and I'll, I'll have to take that back. Um, okay. I, I, um, so what we do with the, the format that we put it out in is a flat text file that has all the information, like I mentioned before, of the area description field, the altitudes, and, and those those things. Thanks. So Abby, I got a question for you. So we've heard about the AIS Reform Coalition. Can you explain what that group is and how it relates to this work that Brian is talking about? Oh yeah, Jill, that's a really great question. So again, AIS is Aeronautical Information Services. The Reform Coalition, the AIS Reform Coalition is a group of of industry, um, aviation industry professionals that includes NBAA, AOPA, A4A, IATA, uh, NASEO, AAAE, <laughs> ACI, North America, uh, and then several, uh, NACA, PASS, and uh, several airlines. They got together and said, hey, I think we, if we work together, on our common issues, instead of doing it one on one, we can make headway. They met with our chief operating officer, Terry Bristol of the air traffic organization and listed out for her their concerns around NOTAM information and other aeronautical information and, and asked for help. Ultimately that ended uh, in, in, a, in a study that showed there were several paths that we wanted to take. And that's when I was asked to be the champion to implement these changes. So we meet monthly with the coalition and the coalition, this was just one, um, uh, the root data, for example, was just one big issue that they had where aeronautical information was inconsistent and it was interfering with their ability to optimize the safety of their operation and the efficiency of their operation. Great, thank you. I think that's a excellent example of how we when we collaborate with our stakeholders that we can really get some great work done. So Brian, let's talk about temporary flight restrictions or TFRs as they're more commonly known. And I want to remind everyone um, that on August 20th, our session is going to specific is going to focus specifically on TFRs. But of course, we'll address any question we can right now as well. Yeah, absolutely, Joe, let's let's dive into TFRs. So important things to note with TFRs and a lot of because of what the feedback we've heard from our stakeholders is we've improved the charting of more permanent TFRs like the Disney TFR. And we've also improved TFRs for sporting events by providing the sporting event locations and working with sport, sport organizations to provide the best in, available information to our stakeholders. An example of this would be like during the Super Bowl a temporary flight restriction of three nautical miles around that stadium is issued. And important to note too, 
This TFR applies to all users of the airspace, including our UAS operators. So I'm wondering, let's see if we can see what the stakeholders are saying about TFRs. Yeah, it looks like we got a question on TFRs and it was, where can I get TFR data? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, currently TFRs are accessible again via the NOTAM search at that site that I messaged mentioned before, the notums.aim.faa.gov slash notum search. And we'll, again, we'll provide that in the chat. And um, another question, I know you kind of, you mentioned this, but can, I just want to make sure that we're very clear that do drone pilots need to read TFRs? Yeah, that is, that is important and we should be clear. Yes, drone pilots must check for TFRs before they fly. Uh, TFRs are issued to protect people and property on the ground and in the air, uh, often after a national disaster or a wildfire. To illustrate why this is so important, let's use wire, wildfires as an example. So when people fly drones near wildfires, fire response agencies often have to ground their aircraft to avoid the potential for a mid-air collision. Deploying Airborne response poses, delaying this airborne response poses a threat to our fire, firefighters on the ground, residents and property in nearby communities. And it can allow wildfires to grow larger. So the National Interagency Fire Center or, or NIFC says it best, if you fly, we can't. So there are a lot of uh, resources available to drone pilots on faa.gov slash UAS. So I would recommend everyone to just check that out. Yeah, and I think I want to point out something about temporary flight restrictions or TFRs. There are a really specific set of NOTAMs and they're notices to airmen that are all about a very specific geospatial data set. And, I, and as we refine the data integrity, I think it's gonna be just really transformational to the public. So I'm excited to hear more about it in depth uh, soon. So Brian, I know you mentioned it a few minutes ago that aeronautical charts were one of the two things that are really near and dear to your heart. So could you tell us a little bit about aeronautical charts? Yeah, I'd be happy to. As a uh, former cartographer, this is really uh, key and, and, and is close to my heart. So a couple things on aeronautical charts that I really like to highlight. Um, as I mentioned in, in the intro, in 2016 with the FAA's External Data Access Initiative, we made great strides in delivering the underlying chart information in new ways. So we stood up the, our aeronautical data distribution service to provide the underlying information to our en route charts, our IFR en route charts, in new ways. This service allows our stakeholders to download the 56 day chart information in KMLs or shapefiles, as well as utilize uh, application programming interfaces or APIs. We've received really great feedback on this service for our en route charts. And we wanna hear what other chart information our stakeholders are really looking to get more access to. It's, it's really driven why we're having this conversation and, and continuing that effort. And Abby, a question for you. How does the FAA uh, verify data on the charts? Well, How do they I ensure mean, data integrity, I guess is the question. Well, so, I mean, in general uh, speaking, that the, the team and the whole organization that the two of you work in, Aeronautical mm -hmm. Information Services, you're the data stewards. And so um, your job is to make sure that information that comes in is consistent uh, with cartographic standards and um, engineering standards when it comes to uh, the way routes are structured in and out of airports or, or en route. And um, a lot of heavy work goes into, um, and I learned a new term when I was in aeronautical information services, the geosity um, is uh, a big deal and a huge amount of, of education and um, thought leadership goes into verifying that those data sets and storing them. 
Great. And just to just to let everybody know, just in our past lives, like Brian said, he was a cartographer and I myself was a terpster or as the tone is known. So Wait, what's, Abby, a, what's a terpster, Jill? A terpster. You just gave insider trading. I gave inside news. So anyway, a terpster, for those of you that don't know, is the one who develops instrument flight procedures, um, ensuring that um, basically ensuring they, they design highways in the sky is the best way to determine. So just to make sure everybody is safe when you're flying around. So you know, it, when we we're when we were talking about TFRs, it made me remember something that we did that was a was really in support of the data uh, integrity and kind of democratizing the airspace. Last, uh, I believe it was last September, um, I uh, hosted a meeting uh, that included uh, many groups such as. NFL, Major League Baseball, IndyCar, NASCAR, uh, NCAA uh, Division I schools, as well as the International um, Air Show Association. And this was a really important meeting around the NOTAMs that we call temporary flight restrictions because um, we need to share the airspace. And the people that use the airspace, like many of you that are tuning in today, needed better data and understanding of when those temporary flight restrictions were actually in, um, in action and, um, and when they're not. Because I think the notice to airmen says right now, you have to stay three nautical miles away from a stadium event, but leaves it up to the pilots to, or dispatchers or controllers or whomever to figure out when that was. So we met with them and we realized that the deconfliction of the some uh, 6,500 plus events every year uh, didn't, it really boiled down to about seven events that were in conflict. The parties all agreed that they could work together and share the airspace well. And what the benefit to us and to the people we serve is we're getting, we're, we're moving continuously forward and getting real-time information on those temporary flight restrictions. And so that's gonna be even better data integrity for the public. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty proud of that and pretty excited in the willingness of the organizations to work together and with us on that. That is great. So Brian, just a question back to the charts, the aeronautical charts, do drone pilots need to read them? Yeah, so. Yeah, that's, that's a good question. So in short, yes. Um, because VFR charts are referenced on the remote pilot tests that are part of 107 drone pilots take, these charts are handy to find out if they're in uh, controlled or uncontrolled airspace, uh, what, what class of airspace they might be operating in, whether or not they would need an airspace authorization, um, and the locations of military training routes and other info. It, it's, there's a lot of really great information on those charts, no matter if you're a drone pilot or a um, or, or other uh, operator. Great. Um, final question for you from Dave. One of our um, participants, Dave, has a question he wants to know, he heard that the FAA is moving toward a 56 day charting cycle for all sectional charts. Is this true? Yeah, that's a great question. Thanks for that, Dave. Um, yes, we, we are. And we're really thrilled to announce this. So we'll, we'll be publishing our visual flight rules or VFR sectional charts on a 56 day cycle, starting with the February 25th, 2021 chart cycle. That is awesome news. And a lot of effort was put toward that. So it awesome was, job. yeah. So, and I'll, let me just say why it's important too, because um, this effort, this is aligning the, the VFR sectional charts with our other charting products and publication dates to reduce the amount of permanent notams. And I know Abby really loves to hear this. I love and, to hear it. It's such a great process improvement. And I know it was a huge, uh, huge matter to get to, to overcome uh, getting those right on the same sh cycle. Yeah, it was, it was. And not only you, do you love to hear it, but I, hopefully our stakeholders would really love to hear it because at the end of the day, what that's gonna mean is fewer notams that they see in their, exactly. while they're going through their pre-flight pre pre -flight uh, program. 
That is great news. Awesome job there too as well. Um, so now just go, let's move on to obstacle data. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so yeah, let's let's move on to obstacle data. <laughs> <laughs> um, so obstacle data, uh, a little bit about it. Uh, first, obstacle data is currently distributed by the FAA through the digital obstacle file or the DOF. Um, this is a product that's a, it's a flat text file that we post daily um, on the same site that we referenced before, the faa.gov slash go slash AIS. And you can see all of our digital products there. Um, but, but a little bit about obstacle data. Obstacle data is a key part of our foundational data for our charting products and services. From the most ba basic perspective, an obstacle is a feature, man-made or natural, that extends beyond the Earth's terrain. These obstacles, whether they're trees, or buildings, or cranes, for example, uh, they impact everything from notice to airmen, or NOTAMs, to procedures and airway development. Our teams at FAA evaluate this data daily to analyze what could potentially be hazardous to the safety of flight. So Abby, a uh, question for you. Is there a machine data interface for obstacle data? Not yet, but just like the, from the feedback that we got in November, um, FAA's chief data officer and his team are working to build application programming interfaces or APIs for this. It's also gonna be available in the Aeronautical Commons service, uh, which will be in the AIXM, or as the data uh, nerds here at FAA call it, XM format of data. Great. So Brian, question um, for you. Where can I find the airport frequency data for the chart products? That's a good question. Um, above and beyond just the charts, right? Because you, you can find all of that information and, and more really great information on our aeronautical charts. You can also get this through the 28-day uh, NASA subscription files, the National Airspace System Resource um, subscriber files. And uh, it's also available through our eNASA site. Um, and you, you can find those links all through the Aeronautical Information Services landing page um, that uh, we just posted to the, to the chat. Great. Um, also, do drone pilots need obstacle data? Yeah, so that's a great question. I love this. The, the drone community is really out in force today. It's great. Yes, they are. That is awesome. So um, typically, drone pilots do not need this obstacle data. I recommend that drone pilots watch our drone playlist on YouTube for a better understanding of what they do need to know before they fly. And can you post that, that YouTube site on our chat? Yes, absolutely. Okay, cool. Just done. <laughs> we are in end times. So, so other, so out to our, our attendees, is there any more questions that you have? Again, you can use the Q&A part in the, in the Zoom. If you have any questions, we would love to hear from you. Um, here's a question. Will there be an API for obstacle data? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as, um, Abby just mentioned how we're working with the Chief Data Officer, uh, Natesh Manikov. We are looking to provide an, an API for our, for our obstacle data. Um, this would be the, uh, the daily DOF that I mentioned before, um, which, is, which is really cool and, and something I hope that we'll be able to talk more and give some more information about soon. Excellent. Seeing if we have any more questions. Um, let's see. Can you explain what the authoritative source is for obstacle data? Yeah, sure. So um, the obstacle authoritative source, uh, it's the FAA's single source for all of our obstacle information. This is, this is where we do our analysis and when we need to design new procedures for the National Airspace System or the, where, we, where we pool our information to provide to our users. Uh, in, in the form of the DOF. And it's actually where you'll pull the information. Um, we're going to be pulling the information from there and utilizing the Aeronautical Common Service uh, to publish this information through an AXM format. Um, and I, 
I believe uh, will be hopefully the, the users uh, attending today will be able to attend next week too to hear more about that. Yeah, definitely. Also, have we tried to improve the quality of airport obstacle data required for takeoff performance? So the, the takeoff performance and um, performance engineers, this is, this is something that's um, really key for them. Um, so we, to improve, we're always improving our information and that's, that's, that's part of uh, daily workflow in the FAA. Um, what, what we hope to do, and that's, that's where I mentioned the APIs and through uh, better access to the aeronautical common service, we'll be able to provide that data out and uh, folks like performance engineers will be able to utilize it in, in better, better ways. Great. So again, I just want to reach out for any questions that we might have on obstacle data or any other foundational chart data that the FAA provides. We would love to hear your questions and we'll, we'll provide, we'll, we'll try to provide our very best answer that we can. So please uh, utilize that Q and A portion on the, on Zoom, or if you're use, utilizing the social media, you can do that that way as well. Okay, let's just look a second. Um, looks like we don't have any questions right now, but I do want to thank, say thank you to our audience for all of their questions and their comments. And also a special thank you to Abby and Brian for your time today. It was greatly appreciated. And we hope you all enjoyed your time with us. So please don't forget to join us next week and every Thursday for the next four weeks. And if you haven't registered for the remaining sessions, really hope that you do so. Yeah, thank you everybody. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye.